Hey everybody, we are live and let me just welcome you to TNT Live. In this live stream, we are going to talk about racism, brutality, and the effects on children and what to say to your black friends if you're not black. So let's talk. But before we get into that, if you're new to my channel, I'm Denise Jordan, and I teach traditional homemaking for today's homemaker. So if you want to learn more about making and keeping a home, subscribe and double tap that little bell icon so you don't miss any upcoming videos. Okay, let's get into it. So you may be thinking, wait, she said she teaches traditional homemaking, and typically that's what I'm talking about on YouTube. But every now and then I step outside of my out of my homemaking role into my community nursing role, and then I talk about some topics that are community health issues or pressing topics that, well, that many of us are concerned about today. And this is just such one of those days. And I will say that I struggled whether or not to come on and have this discussion in my blue scrubs like I usually do when I'm talking about a community health issue or if I want to just talk as a mom, a grandmother, a person that's concerned about these issues. And I decided I'd be hiding behind my scrubs if I approached it from that perspective. So here I am talking about it as a mom and a grandmother. So, hey, Peggy, how you doing? It is good to see you. And Elena Jenkins DIY, it's good to see you as well. I have an article that I wanted to share that I found on YouTube. Hey, Nicole from Nesting Haven. It is good to um, have you with us as well. I think it's Nicole. But I found an article um, on line that talked about how all of this social and civil unrest is affecting our psyche. And I know for myself, after watching so much on TV, after watching George Floyd killed again and again and again, it was kind of like that movie where the guy kept waking up at the same point in time to his death. It's like I watched that footage so many times, it was impressed on my brain. And then there was, you know, the young Ahmaud Arbery murder and just so many things that all of these are having an impression upon our psyche. So I've had a couple uncomfortable nights sleeping. I woke up, I had a couple of nightmares. And I was like, wait, what did I dream about? And I realized that all of this is taking its toll on me. So I thought, if all of this is affecting me and I'm an adult and I can able, I'm able to process to a certain extent, what effect is it having on our children? So I felt that as a homemaker, that it was on brand, on topic for us to address this issue here. Hey, Carolyn Prater, good to have you with, me, with us as well, because I thought if you've got little ones, they know what's going on. They've seen the news. They've heard the news. They've heard you talk about the news. And so they know what's happening. So let me just tell you a little bit about this article that I found. And then I will link the article, the um the I will link the address of the article in the description box so that you can find it and take a look at it yourself. But I just want to read you a little bit and then have us talk about that. Because what I really didn't want to do tonight was talk about racism or police brutality or anything like that from my perspective, from my experience, I should say, or anything like that. What I wanted us to do tonight was have an open conversation about what we need to be saying to our children, our families, and then what it is that you can say to friends should you find yourself needing to say something. So let's start with the children. And so this article is how to talk to your children about protests and racism by Sandy Lamott from CNN. And it was updated on June 2nd, 2020. So it's a fairly recent article. And the article starts out by saying that even if your children don't talk about it, and it is the elephant in the room, it's all of this 
social unrest, the protests, both peaceful and unpeaceful, the killing of all these black men, that that's the elephant in the room. That's the it. And the children are aware of it, whether you talk to them about it or not. Hey, Cal, it's good to see you there. And so the article says children and adolescents are experiencing the collateral consequences of the publicized murders of Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and George Floyd, whether they have a smartphone in their direct possession or not. And this is according to a California pediatrician, Dr. Rhea Boyd, who teaches nationally on, relation, on the relationship between structural racism, inequity, and health. So she's looking at the direct connection between structural racism, inequity, and health. And in community health, we talk a lot about, you know, the underserved um, because they're either underserved because of accessibility, availability, or acceptability of health care, that kind of thing. But whether from social media accounts, conversations with peers or caregivers, overheard conversations, or the distress they witness on the faces of those they love, children know what's going on. And without the guidance and validation of their caregivers, meaning their parents, their teachers, those kind of people, they may be navigating their feelings alone. And I thought that was pretty powerful. So just to give you an example of this firsthand, um, my daughter was going to talk to her son, who's 14, about the George Floyd murder. And he already knew about it when she went to talk with him about it because he heard it before her and her husband heard it. He heard it on his smartphone. So when they sat down to have this conversation with him, he already knew about it. And then, oh, a few years ago, my, I don't know, my little granddaughter must have been about seven or eight at this time. This is about three years ago. And this was during the uh, Trump, Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. And when she was told the next day that Donald Trump had been elected as president, she burst into tears and she said, don't they know he touched women inappropriately? Now she's seven or eight. And her mother said, how do you know that? And she said, I heard it on TV. So whereas we don't always know what they're hearing, but you know that old saying, little pictures have big ears. And in case you don't know what that means, think about a little coffee creamer, you know, just a little picture, say about this big. And I meant to have one up here. I took it out the cabinet and I left it downstairs. But it's like those little creamers and they have a big handle. Well, the handle on the creamer is the ear. So it can be a small picture, medium sized picture, but there's always this big handle or ear on the picture so that you can get a good hold on it. And when I say picture, I mean P I T C H E R, picture like a coffee creamer, a gravy boat, maybe, or I don't know, something you might put a lemonade in. But a pitcher, something that you would put water, gravy, something in. So that's what that saying comes from. Little pitchers have big ears, meaning that little people, little children hear more than we think. So that's where that saying comes from. And so they are aware of all of this that's been going on. So another, so I gave you those examples. So according to this article, yes, Carolyn, children are very wise and very smart. They know so much more today than we did at their age. So according to this article, before you have this conversation with your children, and here's tip number one, is that you should take care of yourself first. It's kind of like when you're on the airplane and the stewardess or the flight attendant says, if we lose pressure and the oxygen mass drops, 
put the mask on yourself first. Well, make sure you know where you are and how you feel about this whole situation. You know, wrap your head around it and be in a, at least a calm place when you come to have this discussion with your children, number one. So what are your thoughts and your feelings? What do you believe? And then when you talk to your children, talk to them in an age appropriate manner. For your toddlers, your preschoolers, they're not going to understand a whole lot, but they've been watching and seeing all of this madness on television, just like everybody else has. Because while you're sitting there watching the news, they're sitting on your lap or they're right there on the floor with their dolls or their blocks, and they're seeing and hearing what's going on too. And they can tell by your reactions that something bad is happening. The other thing they may pick up on the scary, the people in the scary mask or the, they might see the police officers in riot gear, that kind of thing. That's a scary thought. Um, or they might see things on fire and wonder about their house getting caught on fire. And I, as I talk about this, I'll just share an incident from my own childhood. And we were having some um, unrest here in our town. I must have been about 12 or 13. And I was in the house and I don't know, there was going to be a march or there's going to be something somewhere, but it's going to be close to where I live. And my parents were gone at this particular time. So I thought I'm going to sneak out of the house and see what's going on. So I snuck out the back door, ran across the street to kind of peer down the street to see what was going on. There was a whole line of police in riot gear and those those big shields, you see them with on TV that they hold out in front like that. And I kept hearing something like, shh, shh, shh. And when I peered around the corner to see what it was, it was the policeman with all that paraphernalia. Needless to say, I turned my little self around and got myself back in the house like, like I should have been in the first place. But I have never forgotten that image of seeing that in my neighborhood when I was a child. So there's that. So when you when I say talk to your children in an age appropriate manner, when you talk to little ones, they have a big sense of what's fair and not fair, particularly if they're around three or four. Something is fair or something is not fair. And I came across an example while I was preparing for this particular session about like how you can show a preschooler what's fair and not fair. And the example given was a little girl asked, could she have a cookie? And her mom said, yes, you can have a cookie after your dinner, after you, after you eat dinner. And so after dinner was over and the little girl asked for a cookie, her mom said, no, you can't have a cookie because you didn't eat all your dinner. And the little girl screamed and stamped her feet and said, that's not fair. That's not fair. You didn't say I had to eat all of my food. You just said I had to eat my dinner. So that's a simple way to explain what's fair and not fair when you're looking at some of this to a child, because they'll get something like that. And if that particular scenario doesn't resonate with your preschooler, you can come up with something else that may resonate in their life that's similar to that. But you want to keep it on a level that they can understand. You don't want to give them more than they can handle. I see Carolyn is saying she's got four grown sons, nine grandsons, and she talks to her son so they can have these conversations with her grandkids. We're going through a lot right now. Yeah, Carolyn, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. In all the articles that I looked at while I was just trying to get my head around how we were going to approach this tonight, they talked about having the talk. And for my white friends that are on or my white viewers that are on, when you hear the talk, typically you're thinking about the puberty talk, you know, like the birds and the bees. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me grab a quick sip. But in black families or minority families, there are two talks. 
the one talk is the birds and the bees, you know, when you hit puberty and all that good stuff. But the other talk is what to do if you get stopped by a policeman. What to do if you get stopped by a policeman. What you should do, what you should not do, what you should say, what you should not say, how you should act. And this talk is primarily, well, is initially given to the boys. And it's usually about age 11 or 12 that this talk is given and then it's repeated. So it's a process. Hey, Sandra at A Beautiful Nest TV. How are you today? I am so glad you could join us because I know you got those two beautiful boys. I know you are very concerned with all this mess that's going on. So, yes. Yeah. So, so I know um, it just sounds crazy probably to my friends that are not black or not a minority that we have to have that conversation, but it is something that we do. And um, even when they get their driver's license, then there's another conversation that you have with them about driving while black. And remember, I used to work at another university and I was talking to one of my colleagues about driving while black. And she said, there is no such thing. I said, Google it. And she Googled driving while black and she was amazed at what came up because there's a whole other scenario that we have to teach them and be concerned about when they get to be driving age. So, yeah, so this is our reality. So these are just some of the conversations that you have to have and you have to be prepared to have that conversation with them. And if you are a um, white mother and you have a biracial child, then you have to have that conversation with them yourself or you've got to get someone that can have that conversation with them for you because you're going to have those same concerns about your son or your daughter as the black parents will have. So it's something that if you've got a biracial child or a black child, brown child, you got to have that conversation. So now I see you, Cal. So get your mind around what it is that you feel, what you can talk about, and then have that conversation with them, with the preschoolers and toddlers. You want to make sure it's on their level with your tweens and your um teenagers, then you can have a more in-depth conversation. But again, don't bombard them with too much information. Keep it in the re in the reality. But they are seeing everything on TV and they are concerned. Just to show you, one of my, um, my sister said she had seen something on YouTube earlier today where there was a little boy, well, a little boy, a boy, a teen, about 14 to 15 years old, playing basketball in his front yard. And he saw a police car come driving down the street and he ran and hid behind the cars in his driveway because he was afraid when he saw the police car because he's wondering, what will they do to me? Because all of this, these images um, is an assault to the psyche. And one of the articles that I read about was about post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And typically, we talk about PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder in, say, veterans, you know, veterans of war or someone who's had some kind of a really bad experience, maybe a car accident or a rape or um, something really significant. Well, what we find is that there is PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder in Black people who have repeatedly watched on screen violence. I'll find that article and link it below because I didn't think to um, have the title for that one with me when I started to talking because I at first I wasn't going to mention that. So I will find it and I'll link it below so that you can check it out. But PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder is a real thing for, for your African Americans from watching all of this violence on TV or having lived it in their communities or being told about it from their families. So, you know, when I was a child, my parents would talk about these kinds of things happening. And I was active in the civil rights movement and those kinds of things here in my town. But it was pretty much pretty mild compared to what we see going on on TV right now. Jennifer, you are quite welcome. 
And, you know, I, uh, Jennifer, as I said earlier, I was trying to decide whether or not I was going to hide behind my scrub and talk about it from a community health perspective, which is how I like to approach community health issues. And violence is definitely a community health issue or a public health issue. But I thought, no, today I just need to be a mom, a homemaker, a grandmother, because that's where I'm at. So, um, so we'll talk, we'll get some questions and things like that in just a little bit. But, you know, let me get the information out first and then we'll do that. Um, so when you're talking with your teens and your tweens, especially when they're seeing all this stuff on social unrest, first of all, do the civics lesson. Give them the history of how the country was founded and the fact that we believe in encouraging civil protest peaceful civil protest. It's, you know, what our country, country was founded on and it's okay to protest peacefully. So they need to understand the difference, you know, what that means, that kind of thing. The other thing you might want to do is limit their screen time. I know that my daughter told her two teens, okay, you guys are going to pick one day. We're going to just disconnect from social media. No cell phones, no TV, no nothing. Because you just need to have some time away from all of that. Otherwise, you know, you start dreaming about it. And it just causes you to have more depression and more anxiety. And <clears throat> one of the articles that I read talked about, about four, this article was written about three years ago after I think it was the Ferguson incident where um, Michael Brown was killed and it talked about the effect of anxiety and that social unrest on expectant mothers and how it changed their behavior, that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it's affecting and the way we live. And I know my daughter said her son wanted to go jogging because soccer tryouts are coming. So he wanted to get ready for soccer tryouts. And the neighborhood that they live in is a diverse neighborhood, but it's mostly a white neighborhood. And there are some, you know, um, African-Americans and Asians and some others, but it's mostly a white neighborhood. And he wanted to go jogging. And she says, no, not by yourself. Because she was concerned about Maybe our neighbors know us. We've been here three years. They should know who we are. They should recognize the kids. But then again, what if there's somebody different coming into the neighborhood, driving around, looking to create some problems or whatever? She's like, no, you can't go jogging in your own neighborhood. Not right now. So that just shows how things are affecting our behavior on a day to day basis. And you have to have that conversation like, well, you can't go jogging because of A, B, and C, you know, that kind of thing. And as I said, limit the screen time, just shut it down, shut it off so they can get away from it for just a little bit. And then um, have for your older ones, your teens and your tweens, have a conversation either around the dinner table or if you don't want to do it around the dinner table because you don't want to generate any stress, then maybe after dinner, sit down with the TV off, cell phones off, and just have a conversation about what's happening and get their thoughts on whatever is going on. Um, so you might want to ask them questions like, what are your thoughts on this? You know, like, what, what do you think about what's going on regarding... Um, the killing of these unarmed black men. What's your thoughts about police brutality? What's your thoughts about the police being charged about this, that, or the other? And when I say have this conversation with your children, all families, white, black, brown, yellow, need to have these conversations because we have to have awake, engaged children so they know what's going on and how to respond appropriately in a given situation as well, because the white children, many of them are just as traumatized by these uh, images as well. They're like, what's happening here and why? This is all new to some of them. So yes, so there's that. So all parents need to have these conversations with their children. And they will engage with, you, with each other via social media, TikTok, 
uh, Twit, Twitter, TikTok and uh, Snapchat and all the other different little things that they do. But we also need to have that conversation with them ourselves just to make sure they're getting the right information. And then the online chatter with their friends might be a way of coping. But again, we want to make sure they're coping the right way. Not that we're going to tell them what to think, but we can help shape their thinking by the information that we give them. So as I said earlier, all children need to be educated on what they're seeing and figure out a way to address it because it's going to affect all of them. And you can ask them like what they've seen, if they've seen anything online about the riots and the protests, you know, ask them what they think. Ask them what's in upsetting about what they've seen or what's inspiring about what they've seen. Or if they think this or that is fair or unfair, because, you know, like many teens, if you say, well, what do you think? You know, you might get that. So try to be a little bit more savvy as to how you approach the question so that you can get an answer. There's a website that I found called Raising Equity. And I did find this website in this particular article and I went and checked it out. And they have um, free videos and other resources that parents, teachers uh, can use to talk to your child about racism. So um, about racism, um, equity and social injustice. So I will link that website in the description box so that you can access that and see what might be there that you can use to work with your child. Hey, Dollar Tree Goodies 5, it's good to have you join us. What we're doing is talking about racism and its effect on children and how all of these negative images regarding the police brutality and the killing of George Floyd, the killing of Ahmaud Arbery, and all of this affects not only our psyche, but how it affects the children. So that's something that we all need to, you know, just really think about. Um, so there's that article. So those are the things to think about in regards to children. Now, let me get my notes in order here. Make sure I'm not missing anything. And see, one of the issues today is that with us spending so much time at home because schools are closed, and normally kids would address these issues at school, well, schools are closed now, so they can't talk about them there. They're spending lots of time watching TV, YouTube, that kind of thing. So Peggy Schindermeyer says she thinks parents should give their children a little history lesson because she doesn't think a lot of this is taught in school. Yeah, Peggy, that you are absolutely correct about that. And um, one of the things that I was going to address next was what to say to your black friends, because we talked about tip number one was to make sure you take care of yourself and have your head in a good place before you talk to your child. Tip number two was to talk with your children and to frame it according to their age group. You want to make it age appropriate, but not giving them too much information, but just enough that they need. And so then tip number three, I wanted to address how to talk to your black friends. So uh, Dollar Tree says uh, her kids all, know, well, Cal's talk says her kids all know. Dollar Tree Goody said it's hard on them. And yes, it is. And Carolyn says, um, so true. She's 58 and black history wasn't taught when she went to school. And um, uh, Leslie at, no, um, yeah, Leslie at Midlife and Nailing It says a great way to teach children is through literature. And if you take a look at that website that I mentioned, uh, which was, um, oh, I just, what was it? The website that I mentioned, it gives you lots of resources in regards to that raising equity. It will have books and different things like that. And there was another 
um, it, it gives a whole list of other websites in this article that I'm going to link that also links you. I think it's called Brown something, but there's another website on there that gives you access to um, books and stories and things like that. And then there's an app that I'll talk about in the as we get closer to the end that has some other resources that you can use. Um, so Stacy from Styling with Stacy says, being from an earlier generation, when this type of open racism was extremely front and center, how did I deal with what I witnessed? Well, in the town that I lived in, it wasn't as overt because you know I'm in Indiana, not saying that Indiana is a utopia because it's far from that, but I didn't have experience with this kind of overt racism myself. Now, my parents and people that were older might have, but I was pretty sheltered growing up. And the neighborhood that I lived in growing up was primarily a black neighborhood. Now we did have uh, white people in our neighborhood, but the black people in our neighborhood was the majority. And then the school that I went to was a diverse school. So it wasn't as overt then as it was now. The black power movement was just getting started when I was in high school. And um, so, you know, the Black Panthers and all that kind of stuff. So we're starting to address things from that perspective. Dr. Martin Luther King was certainly well on the forefront, but we were seeing those images on television and the kind of thing that we're doing now. So I didn't have as much um, of that in my face when I was growing up. I've seen more overt racism as an adult particularly in the last, oh, 10 years and the last five years than I ever did when I was growing up. But okay, so there's another um, uh, app or link on there called Common Sense Media. It's a nonprofit thing that rates movies and it also talks about TV shows, books, apps, and other media for parents in schools that, um, and they've curated over 80 books with diverse and multicultural characters. So those are things that parents can use to help teach their children about diversity, you know, as they get as they get older. But okay, so I already talked about the talk and what that is. So now let's talk about what you, if you're non-black, can say to your black friends. Because I know that's something that um, some of you may be struggling with. And one of the things that this article stated, which I know to be true, is that white people are less exposed to what to do around race and more likely to be socialized to avoid racial matters and see them as dangerous. And this is according to Howard Stevenson, a clinical psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania's Graduate School of Education. This was from another article that I looked at. I'll link it in the description box below so that you can check that out as well. And again, I'll read it one more time. This is just one statement, but he says, White people are less exposed to what to do around race and more likely to be socialized to avoid racial matters and see them as dangerous. And then the article goes on to say that kids need to talk about George Floyd, the protests and racism. And since schools are closed, they got to get that from the parents. They got to get it at home and hopefully they're getting things, you know, in the right order. So what does that mean to you if you're a white person and you may be hesitant to bring it up because the topic is uncomfortable and you don't know what to say? And actually, as a black person, many times to talk about race in what we call mixed company or black and white company is uncomfortable. I can talk to my Hispanic students, my Asian students, and we can talk about being a minority and what all that means and what are some of the particular challenges we may have or whatever. But I don't have that same conversation as easily with my white counterpart. So it's something that we that both sides need to think about. Um, but when you ask yourself, what does it mean to you? As I said, you may have been taught not to talk about these topics in mixed company. 
And but right now, today is really not something that you can ignore because the elephant in the room is all over the TV and social media and everywhere else. So it's something you've got to figure out a way how to address. So I was thinking what might be helpful for you to say, because if you have black friends, they will appreciate it if you say something, because right now, silence is considered to be complicity. Silence is uncaring. Silence is just that. It's silent. So what do you say? Now, these are just some examples that I came up with. So you might say something like, like you might give that friend a call. If you're used to calling them and talking over the phone, you might give them a call. And say something like, how are you doing? I know times are really crazy right now. And I'm just calling to see if you're okay. That opens the door for them to respond back to you. I mean, they're your friend. You know them. They know you. You don't know what to say. So you can say, you know what? I'm just calling to see if you're okay. Times are a little crazy. So, you know, are you okay? That's one thought. Or let's say you connect with this person at work. You know, you're not the kind of friends where you call each other and talk over the phone, but you do chat it up at work quite a bit and you really like this person. So in the workplace, you can approach them the same way. But here's the thing, because like I said, you can't just ignore it. You can't just go to work and act like nothing's happened because we all know that it has. So you can do the same thing. You know, I've been seeing all this crazy stuff on TV. And I was just wondering how you're doing. I don't know what to say, but I just wanted to let you know that I care. Something as simple as that can be useful. And, you know, don't do cliches and don't not do anything. But what you can do is say, you know, I don't know what to say. Like Denise I am so concerned about all of this that's going on and I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know I care. And that'll start a conversation right there. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay, so no shades, no silence. Um, like I said, just as an example, just something really simple. Um, just say something as simple as, I've been watching all this craziness on TV. I am heartbroken and I know you have a son, you have a daughter. I know this has got to affect your family. I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know I care. That's enough. And then they'll come back and talk to you about that. Okay. So like I said, if you know they've got kids, ask how their kids are processing it. You say, you know, you know, how's, how's Tom processing all of this stuff? I know he's just 12 or 13 years old. Is that right? So how's he processing all of this? And again, that's going to give you more of a conversation. Okay, so now... Let's see if there's any questions about that. And then I'll talk about if you're a YouTube creator and what you should do about that. So um, what are you guys thoughts about the suggestions that I gave about if you don't know what to say? Here's an example, because one of the things that I learned from my therapist and trust me, I was in therapy for like two years and it totally cured me. Well, I'm not totally cured, but I'm a whole lot better than what I was. One of the things that I appreciated was when she would give me the words on what to say to address a situation. 
So what do you think about the words that I shared, like giving your friend a call and saying, Denise, I have been watching all of this on TV and I am heartbroken. How are you doing? I don't know what to say, but I'm willing to listen because that's the biggest thing is to be open to listening. To be open to listening because you may not know what to say. It's kind of like when there's a divorce or there's a death. You don't know what to say, but you want people to know you care. So uh, Leslie says she likes the suggestion of asking how someone is processing. And especially with children, it's like, how are they handling all of this? And I told you, if you guys missed the story, I had mentioned how uh, my um, granddaughter, who was um, seven or eight at the time when she was you know, she was real a big Hillary Clinton fan and was hoping that Hillary Clinton would win the presidential election. And when she learned that Donald Trump had won, she burst into tears and said, well, don't they know he touched women inappropriately? And, you know, they get real engaged and involved in different things. And her mom asked her, how do you know this? And she said, I heard it on TV. So they had to talk with her about the elections and the electoral college and all kinds of stuff, which at seven or eight was kind of hard because she thought, you know, that this just shouldn't be. So how you have to put it though in context for that particular child. So Carolyn says we should be open and honest with each, with each other. Yeah, that's true. And definitely it's a time to listen. Listening is so important because you know, people may not necessarily want you to give them an answer or a solution right now. They just may want you to listen. Just They just want to be heard. And then you can get to talking about solutions and different things like that. Um, any other uh, comments or questions about um, the suggestions? Hey, Nicole. Glad to have you with us. We had Nicole from Nesting Haven on, and now we have Nicole North Garden on with us as well. Okay, so let me go ahead and talk about whether or not you should post or not to post if you're a YouTube creator, because I, I think that's important, because I struggled with whether or not to have this session. Like, do I want to talk about this? Do I not want to talk about this? Do I want to talk about it in my community health uniform? Do I want to talk about it as a real person, like as a mom and a grandmother? And I decided, you know, to just talk about it as a mom and a grandmother. So if you're a YouTube creator, do you feel that you need to talk about it on your YouTube channel? And I will suggest that um, video influencers with uh, Benji Travis, Roberto Blake and another woman. I can't remember her name right now. They did a video a couple of weeks ago about whether or not you should post as a YouTube creator on this subject. I will link that video below so you can check it out. But now speaking from a personal perspective, I don't feel that as a YouTube creator, you are obligated to address this subject, depending upon what it is you do. If you are a thought leader like Marie Folio, She's a thought leader. She's a thought leader for this generation. I expect her to talk about this. And her people expect her to talk about this. Jennifer Scott at The Daily Connoisseur. I'm one of her followers. I love her. She's a thought leader. She shares her thoughts on a lot of very interesting topics from pole dancing at the Super Bowl and being lady and being presentable. I expect that she would address this topic, but I wouldn't say that she's required to, but it's something I would expect her to talk about. Um, but if you're a DIYer, you're not a thought leader. I wouldn't say that you would have to talk about this subject on your channel. Um, but what if you wanted to talk about it? So let's talk about how to do that. So there's a channel that I follow called Faith and Flower. And some of you may know her. Um, I forget her name right now as I'm thinking about it. But um, Faith and Flower is her channel. And she does cleanings. 
some cooking, but it's mostly cleaning and organizing her home and that kind of thing. But she also shares her faith. So when she's given her daily routine, she will show herself doing her morning devotion, reading her Bible. And then she usually will say a prayer while she's doing her devotion. So I could see her doing her usual prayer saying something about that in the prayer, maybe praying to God to help ease the tension to make, you know, whatever. I could see her addressing it in the prayer. That would be on topic and on brand for her. Um, if you do DIY or just de de decluttering or organizing, how can you address it to make it on brand? So there's a couple of things that people are sharing, but let me just share one other thing real quick. And then I'll look at those. So um, maybe you might do your regular video. And then toward the end of the video, before you finish it up, you might say at the end, like toward, toward the end of your video, say, you know, in this very difficult time, you know, I'm struggling with whether or not, you know, posting DIY videos or shopping haul videos or whatever is relevant, you know, in light of all this other that's going on. So I just want to say right now that either I care, I'm concerned, I support, whatever, you know, say it there and then say, and I hope to be a light in the darkness right now because, you know, some people want to go to YouTube to escape. So you might be able to say something like that there. Or um, you could address it head on. You know, I know there's a group of ladies that plan to do a tablescape to raise awareness about, you know, racial injustice and police brutality, that kind of thing. Now, Jess says that honestly, the white YouTubers that she subscribed to, she's been looking to see if they mentioned it as an African-American woman. It's important to her. Jess, do you expect them to mention it? I know you're looking to see if they have, but is it an expectation of yours? Now, Leslie at Midlife and Nailing It did do a one minute blackout video because she wanted people to know where her heart was that day and where she stood on the matter. But she think it's her time, but it's her time to bear witness and listen. And I think that was I saw you when you did that, uh, Leslie, and I appreciated it. So um, like, I don't always expect it, but I appreciate it when I see it. So, yeah, so that was great. And, you know, it was something small, but it was impactful. And there was a couple other YouTubers that I said, they said, you know what? I'm not doing my usual video this week. You know, just in light of everything that's going on, it just doesn't make sense to share a shopping haul. You know, that kind of thing. So you can do something like that. But my biggest thought is if you can figure out a way to make it on brand, then do it. You know, try to figure out a way to make it work for you, but also be prepared for the negativity that comes. Like, you know, when I was going live tonight, I knew there was a possibility that I might get a troll. And, you know, you saw that we did get one troll. Hopefully we don't get any more. But you have to be prepared for that. You know, there's always, you know, that that's possible to happen. And um, you could say something at the end of your videos, like once you, you know, address whatever it is that you want to say. In the meantime, I will continue to post on blah, 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 blah. I hope to be a haven of calm for those who come to my channel to escape from some of the noise and the distraction of the world. And then thank people for watching and be done. So there's a couple of ways that you can address it. You just have to figure out what works for you because it's definitely the elephant in the room. It's not like we're not always thinking about it, regardless of what we're doing. You know, even when I'm doing my kitchen vignette video and I'm talking about that, I'm like, you know, I can hear my husband in the other room or in the garage, you know, through the wall with his radio on or not his radio, but his Sirius XM radio. Yeah. On. And they're talking about that. So it's something that is always there. And, it, it, and you know, it's an American issue, but it's not only an American issue. This happens in other places. But right now, America is the one that is just boiling over. 
So what do you guys think about those suggestions for for, for, for your new YouTube channel, whether or not you should say something? Nicole and Nicole, what are your thoughts on that? You know, do you feel like you need to figure out a way to address it or not? That's the question. Um, and I'm thinking like with people that do like Nicole Northgarden, I know you do vintage stuff and what's older than racism? Not any of those tools in your kitchen. And so I suppose if there was something you did want to address in that regard, you could talk about it from the perspective that, you know, you like to collect vintage tools and kitchen appliances and whatever. And one of the things that's going on right now that you realize is, is very old and is still alive and kicking, you know, is racism. I mean, you can figure out a way to, to weave it in there should you choose to. And then one of the things with our teenagers is that sometimes they may want to get involved actively. They might want to join a protest and that kind of thing. And should you take your children to a protest is another question. So, you know, there's that. So Nicole says during the protest, she mentioned George Floyd by name and skipped some videos that week and then rescheduled a collab that week. I, I agree. I think that's good. And I think people appreciate that, Nicole. Uh, Carolyn said she had a four hour conversation last week with her boss. She thanked her for being open and honest. Uh, yeah, all conversations with bosses, regardless of ethnicity, there needs to be a conversation. Nicole says she lost 30 subscribers on Instagram after her black square and was basically like, don't hit, don't let the door hit you on the way out. Yeah, you will lose some subscribers. You will lose some subscribers based upon this topic because everyone does not believe the same thing. <clears throat> And you have to be prepared for that. But for those 30 you lose, you're going to gain twice as many that will appreciate whatever it is that you're doing. And Nicole, you've got to see the really cute little um, vintage stock pot that I picked up. Yeah, Leslie said she lost some on Instagram too. So yeah, yeah, you will. You will lose some. And no, we don't need haters on our channel. You know, I want my YouTube channel to be a beacon of light. Um, I want it to be where people can come and enjoy themselves. But also as a homemaker, which is my thing, I also need to teach those young homemakers hard lessons as well. So that's why I thought, okay, Denise, you know, you always talk about you know, trying to teach your homemakers how to be, you know, a homemaker in an untraditional world. Well, these are the things as homemaker, as mom, as grandma that we have to address. So, um, Maynard mom, um, Karen, I think. Uh, so Karen, I think at Maynard Mom, I think that's her name. If I got that wrong, Maynard Mom, let me know. Because I was trying to remember. And I remembered Leslie Life for Midlife and Nailing It. And Maynard Mom, I'm thinking, is Karen? Anyway. But she addressed it with a Martin Luther King quote on a family picture at the end of a video. But not everyone who watched it would have seen it. You know what, uh, Maynard Mom, and again, remind me of what your name is. You don't have to put something on every video. You don't have to make this your mission on YouTube. That's not what you're on YouTube for. It's okay to mention it one time and then keep it moving. Just do it the one time and we know you care and then keep it moving. That's all you need to do. Oh, yeah. You guys, I got 24 people on. If I could get 24 thumbs up, that would be great. But yeah, you know, that's that's all you need to do. Um, because even if you choose to mention it, you don't have to mention it every week. And whereas we're watching it on TV 
every day and we're seeing it on the news, we're hearing it on our phones and all of that is just like we're constantly being bombarded. You don't have to do that on your YouTube channel. I think one time is enough. Unless you have a platform that lends itself to that, one time is enough. So, so like I said, be prepared for the nastiness that will come your way with these kinds of posts. Because um, there are those people who like to spread negativity. And you can just delete their comments or block them. You can just do that. Uh, let's see, what else did I say? All right. So those are the things that I wanted to share. And so I mentioned the three tips in regards to um, how to handle it, such as, you know, take care of yourself, get yourself in a good place and then talk with your children. And I gave you some suggestions for those. And I'm going to link the articles in the description box for the different articles that I um, use to kind of, you know, prepare this talk. And then uh, the third tip was how to talk to your black friends. And then the fourth tip was YouTube creators, you know, whether or not you need to feel obligated to post. And then do look at the video influencers video by uh, Benji Travis and Roberto Blake. And the woman's name, I can't forget, but she was an Asian woman. And they were talking about whether or not you should post. So take a look at that, you know, and get some guidance from there. Now, Posting something, I think, uh, is helpful because, like, I think it was uh, Jess, I think. Well, one of the people on today said that they like to know that the person they're following cares. So do something discreet. You don't have to do go all fall out. You know, just do something discreet. So uh, Carolyn said she saw something on Facebook that was positive. There was a white male that bought gas and he bought too much more than his vehicle would hold. So he gave the extra to a young black girl, then took a picture and, you know, posted that on uh, Facebook. So that's an act of kindness, that kind of thing. So, yeah. So are there other comments about what to do with the children? That was the biggest thing that I wanted us to talk about, because the children will be more engaged than you know. And you really want to take the time to make sure they're in a good place. One of the other things you can consider doing, I forgot this tip, when you're watching the news, try to watch it when the children are not in your presence, maybe after they go to bed or they're in the playroom or somewhere else and have the have it down lower. The other thing is that even babies and toddlers will feel your anxiety. They're sitting on your lap. They're leaning against your chest, maybe you're breastfeeding and you're watching all of this horrific happenings. You will be stressed. Your heart will be racing. The babies will feel that, too. So whereas they can't voice it, they, too, will feel that. So one of the things you're going to want to do is figure out how to help them get calmed down. Maybe not watch that news while you're nursing or, or when you're putting the baby to sleep or your toddler to sleep. Put on some soft music, rock them, soothe them and get them down and then engage in that kind of in, in news. OK, let's make sure I haven't missed any comments. OK. OK, I think I, I think I hit them all. Okay. So one of the big things we want to do is to make sure that we listen. Um, offer words of encouragement, of support. And if you don't know what to say, it's okay. Just say, you know what? I don't know what to say, but I just want you to know I care. I'm willing to listen. So any other thoughts? So Designers Love says she's tormented because she's one of the ones that are doing the tablescape. 
and really don't want to offend or scold anyone, but wants to get her point across. You know, um, Designers Loft, and I forgot your name. For some reason, I was thinking D, but I don't think that's it. Maybe if, if you've already got your video done, you know, it's done. But if it's not done yet, then maybe you could say something in the video about you want to bring a light, shed a light on diverse, how important it is for diversity and inclusion and how you want to promote unity and awareness of, you know, racial injustice. So, you know, simple things like that. Not simple, but huge. Uh, Jess says she's the mother of four young black men, ages 13 to 25. Stress is her middle name. Yes. But she's been talking to them about police brutality forever. And her two oldest have already had their experiences. Yeah. I understand. I have to tell you, uh, Jess, um, I have two boys, uh, well, two men, you know, they're adult. I mean, you can tell they're men. <laughs> well, you might not if I had a young child late in life, but I did. But they're both men with their own families. But my youngest son, when he was in his senior year of uh, college, he was going to take a semester abroad or a year abroad in London at one of the universities there. And whereas I wanted him to go and get that experience, I was so excited because I always wanted to go to London, you know, that kind of thing. I was terrified because at that time, the IRA, the Irish Liberation Army or the Irish, some kind of Irish Republican Army or something like that was doing a lot of bombing. And there was a lot of like tourists and different people being killed when bombs blew up, blew up. And I was afraid for his safety. And my husband said, Denise, he is safer on the streets of London than he is right here in the town where we live. And he was talking about the possibility of being killed by a police officer, that kind of thing. What is that? What kind of comment is that, you know, on our society? And Jess says it's the norm for all black men, including her, including her husband, because they've become used to it. You know, it's our reality. It's just our reality. Oh, Leslie, I am so glad. You know, like I said, I struggled with whether or not to do this. I even talked to my daughter and my mentee, you know, April Will is my mentee. And then my daughter, I talked to her and she's like, Mom, I think you should. I says, but I just, you know, I have to figure out the right way to do it and you know, I want people to feel comfortable, but I want to be able to give them some tools on what they can use to be able to do something about it. And if nothing else, just to listen and to start a dialogue. There's a young lady on YouTube. Her name is Devereaux, Devereaux and her title, her channel is called The Modern Lady. If you guys are not familiar with The Modern Lady, please check her out. Let me put her channel over here. The Modern Lady. This young woman is amazing. She's a follower of Jennifer Scott, the David Connoisseur. So she does all this ladylike stuff, but it's more but it's very modern. And then she talks about other issues, you know, being assertive for women and just all kinds of stuff. She hadn't been on for about a month. And I'm like, where is she? And almost all of her thumbnails are, you know, some kind of nice, you know, like to, to give you an idea of what she usually looks like. She's got her hair very nicely done, face on, string of pearls, pearl earrings, black dress, you know, very classy, very elegant, very modern. She posted a video like this. It was like three fists, like this in her thumbnail, like one, two, three. And then six solutions for racism. I'm like, whoa. I'm like, is this Devereaux? And she just said, you know, she said that she just felt like her goal is to shed positivity and light in the world. And she felt like her video approaching it from their perspective of solutions was a way of shedding light and positivity. So she stayed on brand about shedding light and positivity, but she, I mean, it, it was on point. It was very succinct. It was very nicely done. And then she gave the six solutions were very nice about what you can do to um, combat racism. One of them, well, I didn't write them down. I should have, but uh, one of them was listening, which we did talk about. 
And one of them was to speak up that if you observe things and the other was to take action. And she talked about these uh, resources like the five call app and another app that she found on, on Apple or somewhere that had a lot of different resources for you to be able to talk about racism with your family, resources to use and things like that. And the five call app is one that gives you information about how to contact your senators, your representatives, if you wanted to contact them and, you know, and give your point of view and even had scripts and different things like that to say. Very nice, very nice, very nice. So you guys should definitely check her out. But I was like, whoa, then I'm like, okay, if this young woman can come out of her, you know, usual perspective and address this head on, I thought, what kind of example am I saying? And so um, I think it was Leslie. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, Karen said that she's glad that I'm speaking about it, that my voice is important. And I thought, you know, I, I guess I didn't see my voice as like being really important. But I do have a few people that do follow me and engage with my content. And I thought, you know, you know, I always talk about being a role model and trying to teach young homemakers. Well, here's my opportunity to give them some guidance on how they can approach some things. Nicole Northgarten says that she talked to her son about how his experience in this world with the police will not ever be like that of a black man and that she doesn't worry about him running down the street and getting shot for it. Exactly. And Nicole, I, I got it. I understand. And I have to tell you what, uh, what I was talking to a colleague at uh, the university one day and her children went to the school where a young man died in a car accident running from the police. Now, um, and we were talking about it. And the, the bad thing was all of these children have been at a funeral the day before for one of their classmates who had been killed. And then the next night, this boy was killed in a car. Now, this was a good boy, never got in trouble, that kind of thing. But when, you know, it was at night and, you know, when those red lights came on and that, that the police were behind him and wanted him to pull over. You know, he panicked and just took off driving and had a car accident and died. So when I was talking to my friend about this at work and, you know, I made the comment, I says, well, you know, we have the, the, the conversation with them when they are young, when they are about 11 or 12 years old about what to do if you're stopped by the police. And she said, yes, Denise, but certainly you don't teach them to run. I says, no, we don't teach them to run. We tell them, put your hand on the steering wheel and keep them there in plain sight. If the officer asks you to roll down the window, say, I'm gonna roll down the window, put your hand back on the steering wheel. You know, we, we teach them that kind of stuff. I said, but this is their reality. What they know is that in the hands of the police officers, you die. If you run away, you likely might have more of a chance, but you may also die. So it's like, and and I said, and, and, and here's the difference. I said, if your son, and this was a white colleague, I said, if your son gets pulled over by a police officer, he'll get the opportunity to explain himself. My son may not. So those are the differences. So yes, and... And Nicole, you're right. Um, you're right. And we should be allies. So exactly right. So we all want that for our children. So Carol, uh, Jess says that the men in her family are becoming numb. They might be becoming numb, but you know what? This has got to stop. We can't become numb. We have got to press on and get these things to change. Okay, so anything else we need to address? You know, I think we covered all the points that I wanted to cover. I don't want to belabor the issue. I don't want to keep you guys on just to keep you guys on. But is there something else you guys need to address? Was this helpful? If this was helpful, if you guys could just say, yes, this was helpful. Because I did want to be of service. You know, I wanted it to be helpful so that we could all come from a positive place.
And here's my question for you. What can you do to help make a difference in your own family? You know, just drop me a comment in the comment section below. So Carolyn says, uh, Nesting, Nicole says this was helpful. Cal says, yes, it was helpful. So people agree that it was helpful. So I am so glad that people felt like it was helpful. So if nothing else, you got some, you know, some ways to handle things with your children. You know how to talk to some friends. So Peggy says, if it wasn't the fact that she was 70 years old, she would be out there protesting with the young ones. Yeah, Peggy, but don't. Because you saw them push that 75-year-old man down and he was in the hospital for a good while, probably still is in critical condition. So, you know, vulnerable populations, pandemic, you need to be home. But thank you for wanting to. But what you can do to help is have a conversation with your family members, that kind of thing. No, 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 no. Carolyn, what she, what she means to not get killed, she means you should expect better. That's what it is. We should expect better and we should all expect better. That's what it is. We expect better and we want better. You know what you guys can do too? You know, you take that five call app and um, it gives you a list of some of the various um, issues that are on hand right now. And what you can like what the issues are and who you need to call to talk to about it if you need to make one, two or three calls or whatever. So, OK, well, all right, then I think we can just wrap this up. So this has been this has been a good talk. I'm glad that I did do this because I feel better having had this conversation with you guys as well. So. I'll chat with you guys later. See you next time. Oh, she she understands that, you know, with the typos and different things like that, uh, sometimes we leave a word out where it puts in something that we didn't we didn't mean. So, yes, she understands. Hey, Wendy. Sorry, we're wrapping things up now. Wrapping things up. Okay. God bless everybody. Good night. I think I got all the comments.